Hey YouTube, Robert here. Today we're going to solve the second part of Kaiju, which used to be a, me a medium box on Bone Lab, but uh, that got pushed too hard uh, by XTT because we kept on nagging him that we like kept on bashing our heads against the desk. And I think we left off at the part where uh, we figured out that KeyPass is installed in the system and what to do with it. Uh, as soon as we discover that we have write privileges in the installation directory. So one thing you can do as soon as you have like uh, your session as SASRV200 on the system is just to run, uh, open up a new PowerShell, of course, and just run a quick get process to see which processes are running on the box. And we notice nothing in particular so far. You could repeat that uh, quite some time, like let it run in a, in a for loop and pipe it out into a new file. Or you could use uh, this handy repo called WinPSPY, which is written by XCT himself, uh, which is basically uh, behaving just like um, PSPY for Linux, but for Windows. And if we run, uh, I'm running the wrong directory, of course. If we run WinPSPY, and uh, tell it to monitor the C drive. Uh, we can tell, or we can see which processes are currently running, and we see new processes as soon as they pop up. And if we go through, through the list right here, oh, we can actually see it. Okay, <laughs> now it's running. Uh, we could leave it on like for a few minutes to see if it's uh, going to run or if it's being run periodically, but. Uh, I think we can skip that. Yes, uh, there's something uh, running in the background, which is opening and closing key pass um, on a regular basis. And what we can do then is if we take a look at the E drive and go into public software, I think it's key pass two, uh, we can see that there's a plugins directory. And if we have write access to that directory, there's a neat little plugin called uh, Keyfast Reborn, which actually uh, is kind of a, like a malicious plugin that uh, hooks into the KeyPass process and extracts the uh, KeyPass database in plain text into a file um, called maybe, for example, export.xml um, in a location that we specify with uh, the plain text database attached. So before you can just uh, compile and run it, there's a few things you have to notice. Um, if we go into the plugins directory right here and select the C-sharp file, we can actually see the source code. And the keen eye might spot an issue straight away, which is message boxes. Um, those are not that big of a deal if you're running like in an RDP session and uh, in the context of that user. But um, as soon as you only have like a CLI window, those message boxes will um, stop the plugin from working because they uh, require user interaction and we don't have any like mouse support to click the message boxes. So if you uh, download or if you clone the repo, just make sure to get rid of all the message boxes in the um, plugin extension as well as, because we don't know in which context the process is running actually, uh, we need to change the export file path because by default, uh, it's using the app data folder, uh, which we probably cannot reach from our current context. So just uh, delete all of this and uh, extend this path to something you reach. For example, I see program data. So if we go back to the box, uh, we can basically now just take a look at C program files, of course, I want to have program data. Uh, we can see nothing is there. So uh, another thing to note is that, let's take a look, users SASRV200 and into the keypass directory. Um, before you compile it, you actually need to specify the key, uh, original keypass of EXE, I think as well as one or two uh, DLLs. So it compiles for the correct version. And the keyfast reborn plugin goes into public software keypass to plugins. And uh, now all we have to do is go into the C program data and wait a bit until keypass is being run again and maybe we can take a look at the plain text uh, export.xml 
Uh, now we should be good to go. Uh, we can see, yes, there's the export.xml. Uh, Let's take a look at it. Cat export.xml. Uh, we see a bunch of stuff here, but the interesting thing, there we go. There's the key, and there's the protected memory true. And this is a plain text password, which should belong to the local administrator. Uh, the next step would be, of course, uh, let me shove the window up there, make a new split. I know that uh, some of you uh, mentioned the terminal font size was uh, kind of small in the last video I did. So uh, I hope that one's better now. If still not, please let me know in the comments. And I uh, let's say I can <laughs> increase it quite a bit again. But I think it should be good now. So the next uh, thing that we could do is um, dump some credentials from the machine. But... You could do this, uh, for example, uh, like hook up a beacon. You just have to use SSH to do like uh, two reverse port forwardings um, or one port forwarding to get back to your local machine. Um, well, we don't need that right now. So I think we can skip it and just um, uh, as, a, as a reminder, like running NXC and grabbing credentials from the LSA is not the most OPSEC safe method in that case. Uh, but I think for the lab right now, it should be fine. I think we could run, like, if only if Defender is running, I didn't check, to be honest. Uh, but if only Defender is running, you could either, like, disable it or uh, just just use NanoDump, for example, to grab the uh, credentials from LSS itself. Just wait a bit. Um, running anything through the proxy is quite slow. Uh, there we go. There's our first set of domain credentials right here, uh, Claire Frost. And we get the credentials from the SA SRV200 as well. Uh, we can, of course, verify them. Like if we run proxy chains, NXC again, run it on the same machine, but use, for example, Claire Frost with her password right here. Uh, it should choose the domain automatically and just see if those credentials are valid. Uh, yes, they are. Uh, the next thing I'd like to run uh, or uh, that you could do, for example, is like run a Bloodhound dump uh, or do some LDAP queries to see what you can reach or if there's anything interesting. Uh, we can save that for now. Uh, we don't really need it for this box. But what we can always check, and I recommend you to do it as well, is just check for the ADCS config uh, using the LDAP module from NetExec, for example. If I choose the right IP, that is. There we go. Uh, we can actually see that we have two um, certificate authorities in the network, which is like uh, the domain controller and uh, uh, sub-CA, um, BERSRV105. Um, as soon as I see like there is a PKI instance uh, or any any sort of CA, um, it's worth a look with Certipy. Certify, let's run find. I think this command should be good. Just need to swap out the IP 1010.219.197 and hope that it works this time. So uh, if I run Certify through proxy chains, I've been running into quite some issues, but should be good. Let's make this window a bit bigger. Might take a while, but we can already see that both of these certificate authorities are vulnerable to an ESC8. Um, for those of you who don't know, the uh, ESC8 is basically like one of the classics that we um, fairly that we encounter fairly often in uh, real engagements still, uh, which basically just means that web enrollment is enabled and the request disposition is set to issue. Uh, that means like no manager approval or anything. Um, that requests, if they are submitted and if they are valid, they will be uh, issued. Um, what we can basically basically do with that is if it's uh, misconfigured or like um, some security measures like EPA uh, are not enforced, that we can basically relay uh, a chorus and authentication from the domain controller and relay it to the CA. Uh, like prepare a um, certificate signing request, sign it with the uh, or provide it in, uh, in conjunction with the um, NetNTL MV2 hash that we just captured and tell the CA basically, hey, I'm domain controller, please give me uh, a certificate. And the CA will happily do that. 
uh, sign the request that we just sent, and we can use the resulting PFX uh, certificate to uh, go to the domain controller itself and tell it, hey, domain controller, I am another domain controller, please give me a TGT. And from that TGT, we can extract the NTLM hash. I think you know the drill on how to abuse an ESC8. The only trick now, which is the mind-bending twist in that case, is that if you remember back like the original port scans that aside from FTP and SSH, only RDP was open on the boxes. And that requires not only some mind bending, but some port bending as well. <clears throat> uh, which brings me to the next uh, Git repo, which is port bender. Uh, port bender is a buff, like a beacon object file for Cobalt Strike. There is a version for Sliver as well, uh, but I haven't got that running properly. Uh, it's just a uh, note, like just a, a mention here. Well, this is basically uh, a program that allows you to redirect incoming traffic on port 445 from one box to uh, another pod on the local host or to another host in the network. Um, just an advice, if you're going to use that in a real engagement, make sure you're not doing it on anything on any machine that relies heavily on port 445. I think they stated here somewhere as well or uh, in the in the respective blog post like don't blame us uh if you crash the uh customer's file server um because it it's going to redirect every incoming traffic on port 445 back to wherever you're redirecting it to so be careful if you're executing that like um smb is kind of essential for windows so just be careful but what we are going to use in this case is another program called stream that word uh, which is basically using the same thing, like it's using the uh, WinDivert um, driver. Um, we can specify a config file. And the neat thing here is that we can essentially um, choose which IP address to redirect. Like if we have incoming TCP traffic on port 445 from this address, we can relay it uh, or redirect it onto another box, which would basically not break like anything Windows related or SMB related and just like traffic from that specific IP. So uh, if you compile it, or I think it's already pre-compiled, never use pre-compiled stuff, but I think for the labs, it's okay. Um, make sure to copy all the contents from the directory into the same directory as the stream divert library, because it needs the driver in the same directory. So let's just hope that this works because the last time it didn't. Of course, you, you need admin privileges to do so. So let me just kill that session real quick and open up another. I want my dynamic port forwarding. And of course, we need a, a reverse port forwarding as well because we want to redirect port uh, 8445 on the box to 445 on our box. And we want to do this at administrator at 1010.219.198. That should be good. And that should work. Now, if we go back to C users SASRV200, there should be a directory called stream divert. Uh, you can use whatever you want to like transfer the files. I think SCP would be a good option. Um, of course, open the PowerShell. And if I take a look at my config of text, we can see I'm basically just redirecting for port 445 from anything onto a localhost port 8445. If we use the stream divert, the specify the config file. And one important thing, uh, if you type in techf, um, it's going to create the necessary uh, firewall rules automatically for you. So you don't have to uh, take care about that. Dash V, and that should be good. And you can see inbound TCP divert proxy, that's looking good. Starting packet diverters, that should be good. And just as a quick method of uh, verification, we can run our responder on ton zero and do a little coercion. You could use Petit Potem or like, uh, if you want to stay on the local box, you can of course use something like um, printer bark or uh, spool sample, uh, whatever 
the tools are called right away. Uh, I think worse, it should be fine in that case. We'll just do this uh, and make sure to specify the listener as the um, device you're actually listening on. So not your local box, but the box that you have an SSH session on, for example. Um, that should look good. No authentication received, but we can already see it like, uh, okay, it's answering to us and it's going to divert the packets. So it's actually doing something. Oh, you're getting a lot of bad netpad errors, but nothing is happening on our box for whatever reason. But maybe, I don't know if I did something wrong here. Let me check for a second. So um, I don't know what happened there, why my responder wasn't catching anything. If you know why, uh, please let me know. But if we just run like uh, the usual NTLM relay X, uh, relay to um, the sub CI, uh, I don't think you have to specify the full path, like even just uh, HTTP and the IP itself should work. Just specify the you know, SMB2 support, uh, specify ADCS, of course, which template you want to enroll, be careful and make sure that the template you want to enroll is enabled uh, because sometimes like default templates, domain controller, domain controller authentication, Kerberos authentication are disabled and replaced with something uh, similar. So uh, check your environment. Uh, we don't need a bunch of service like uh, we could just leave them out. And if we're going to use Coercer again, uh, we should be good. Uh, there we go. We can already quit that. We can see that we're waiting for connections. Uh, the HTTP <laughs> returned an error code 200, reading a lo uh, successful login. And it says, yes, the authentication has succeeded. And we have our base 64 encoded certificate right here for the BER SRV100, which should be the domain controller. If we're going to use this, we just make a new file. I call it dc.base64. Uh, cat dc base64, base64-d, and save it as dc.pfx. Uh, we can then use proxy chains, 4-q home, over local bin certify. Uh, auth pfx, uh, this was a last try, dc dot pfx should be good. And there we go. We get a hash for the domain controller. And notice that just uh, because we have the hash of the domain controller itself doesn't mean that we are admin. In fact, if we just try to use it itself, uh, Towards NXC SMB 10.10.2.19.197, tag you BR SLB 100 with the hash. Of course, that's what I wanted to copy. Uh, it should be accepted, but it's just like uh, a normal connection. Um, not an admin because uh, even the domain controller itself is uh, just another computer. A bit more, of course, but um, in that context. So what we can do instead is go ahead and use what been secret stump. And I think this is an old IP. We can change that to 219.197. And we'll just specify a specific user. Let's use, I think, just DC user, just DC user administrator, for example. And there we go. We have the admin hash, that one. And if we use proxy chains for hash q evil winner m, we just change the IP to 219.97. Uh, submit the hash. And we are admin. Um, yep, well, I think that's it. Uh, it was a nice box, to be honest. Uh, 
Uh, I'll see you on the next one. Have fun.